Here we have a zenith transoceanic all wave radio from 1962. This is the 3000-1 and mine was made in May of 1962 as it says on the inside. It is currently dead. I think that the power supply crapped out on me so we're gonna just do a little checking around and we are going to build a new jack on the power supply. This is something that I've been wanting to do for a couple months now since it died. Um, but since it's Earth Day, you know what, why not? Because I think a typical person would throw this in the trash. Because, I mean, it's in pretty rough condition. Physically. You just screw that and then it pops down. So, let's get into the repair. I know that the um, outdoor session is quite loud. And as you can hear, somebody is somebody hired someone to take down a tree, which, yeah, taking down, <laughs> isn't that just a pleasant thing to do on Earth Days? Cut down a tree. Look at that engineering. It says Zenith right there with the crown logo. It says Zenith going down there. That's the AM antenna, that's the FM antenna. Um, so... Yeah. So after doing a little digging around, I found this little gem, which will cut the wires off and use a few inches of wire. And this little gem in my parts bin, I think this uses 12 volts. It does. So yeah, I guess what we'll do so we'll take, we're going to completely cut off probably those two, at least one red and one black, and then probably trim it down to right past the glue blob, one, the other red and black, and then I'll strip those wires down, and then I will find the terminals in there, and we will solder that on there. This fits into there. The polarity is outer negative, so I'll have to remember that the outer side, whatever is connected to that, is going to be the negative wire. Um, now this is something that I care about. Very good, very extremely well built radios. I'll show you guys on the inside. Um, it just lasts forever. AM, FM, shortwave, and it's my only shortwave radio. That's a really good deal for it. With a quick run down to my workshop, I picked up wire cutter and wire stripper combo. So I'll figure out what goes to what, and we will get that on there. So I figured out that red is in the center, so red will be positive. So I'm going to cut these two off. Try to get rid of that glue blob there. I hate those glue blobs because you can never get them out. And we're going to reline it too using the 1952 Heathkit RF generator. Or at least see if it needs a lining. It has tubes in it. And this was built by the original owner in 1952. Very nice piece of test equipment. Repaired that, put new tubes in it. Uh, a few weeks ago, so yeah. Oops, sorry about that. Um, very unprofessional. <laughs> Anyways, I'll cut those down and then, uh, yeah, we can see what it does. Now to show you how easy it is to open up one of these for serviceability, just go till it pops, and out this back door comes with fully replaceable plug-in socketed components. The original service tag, 5 of 62. Not sure what that thing is there. There's all the transistors, matched output, driver, first audio, third IF, second IF, first IF, 
I think this is for AM up here, AM oscillator, RF mixer, and then this is for FM. FM oscillator and mixer, and then FM, RF. This is the FM inside this box right here. That's the FM circuit. I think this is, yeah, this is for the antenna. Socketed. They really don't build them like they used to. It's got one of these classic Zenith things up here, these pins. There's external antenna, which it has these little notches right here for external antenna output. Um, ah! And here is what we will be fixing. That does not seem to be in too good a shape. I think what we're going to do is just, we're going to completely snip this off. We're going to snip this brown thing off, but we're going to get this plug out of here. Plug used to go out there. They haven't really used plugs like this since maybe the late 70s or early 80s, so we're probably not going to have to worry about using that. I won't throw it away, though. That's If I were to throw stuff away, I wouldn't have this here, and I think this is the only one I have. So, I will show you guys when this is cleaned up with the new socket. Let the parade of grackle noises and fire truck sirens begin. We have one line in there. Is it perfect or pretty? No. Does it work? Yes. Come on, focus. There we go. It is soldered in there. It kinda looks like it isn't, but it is. Time to get the other one connected to the white. Um, is this pretty? No. Does it work? Yes. So, yeah. Um, let's get that soldered in there. You know, when you see this, inside an electronic. Try to stay away from it. And I saw this when I was gonna buy this. And I thought about it pretty hard, but for a Zenith TO3000 for 15 bucks, I mean, I don't care if this is missing, I'm still gonna buy it. This IF can is missing, I'm still probably gonna buy it just because it's so cheap. Um, so anyways, this is soldered in. I just need to get it insulated with some a little, a little bit of a electrical wire. And let's see if it works. Hopefully I didn't wire it backwards, but I really don't think I did. It's also impossible to solder out here. It's about 50 degrees outside, um, which is warm lately. Um, and the wind is blowing pretty hard. And that's the soldering iron down there. Only 25 watts. so. It's not a real hot one either. Um, so, uh, yeah. I kind of hated to pull this out, but it kind of had to be done if I wanted to get it working. Focus. Since that's an original part, not the brown wire, but the attachment, but I'm not going to throw the attachment away. Uh, so I will guess I'll hook it up with the signal generator and see how it performs. Why don't we call this video the yes, Earth Day Special because I'm only really using scraps that I find. I didn't, f I didn't pull this off of the reel of tape. I found it um, attached to my workbench. I was trying to do something with it but then got distracted. Never did. So put off little pieces of this strand right here. It is in remarkably good shape, but it was dangling like that, so I guess unless I had a really strong fan running, it wouldn't be able to wrap itself up. So I'll get that installed and we can test it. So we have it all taped up in there. Now if I were to see this kind of thing going on in here with this loose ground wire, I probably wouldn't. If it was not one of these, I probably wouldn't buy it. But So I gotta get it all connected up. Um, remember these little notches I, show, I showed you earlier? Those are going to come in handy when the wire can go like this and hang out of there. Because uh, it obviously won't fit in there. So, yeah. Uh, let's get it connected. 
So I'm not getting anything. Um, turned it on. And it didn't work. This did work, however, a couple months ago. So, looks like this might have, like I'll turn it up like that. Dial around on FM. And FM is really strong on this. So I'm gonna take my multimeter, measure that. So as more sirens fill the air, we're gonna go to DC voltage 20 volts. That doesn't seem right. 17 volts. And there's something wrong with this thing. Oh, go away, stupid. <laughs> uh, whatever you call it, ambulance. Okay, so let's check the other power supply that I brought. That seems a bit better. That's coming off of a different power supply that was that came from an old camping TV that I had. It was long gone now. I think we gave it to Goodwill or something when they turned off the analog broadcast. 11.9 volts. The other one I think is, yeah, we're gonna part that one out and then maybe we can take the capacitors out of there, use them for things like this. Those are high voltage capacitors. 11.9 volts. This one seems better. Okay, I have determined that that wire down there is hanging by a thread. And I don't think that th thread, um, I don't think that thread makes it up to there. So this is not getting connection. Something is wrong with this down here. So I think I'm going to strip this wire down. Obviously cut it out from there, and then uh, solder it into there with a longer connection, a way better connection too. I think it's kind of acting like a cold solder joint in there in the wire. So, I reconnected this wire down here with a bit more slack on it. And let's see if it works. Got our cord. Okay, good, that goes to that one. Hold on, let me get it connected. It is connected. And the volume is up and it's still dead. Okay, I was planning for this. I think I know what happened. Um, I think that in one of these there's a complete break because I was kind of rough when I was stripping the wires. What I'm going to do is we're going to eliminate both of these red and black wires after doing a little bit of testing and then just solder the white and brown to there, pretty much, eliminating these two wires. I think these two wires are dead. Sorry this video is getting a little long, but we're going to check this with the multimeter if I can get it to work to see if there's a break in the line. Let me get this situated. And would you look at that, there is a break somewhere in there, it is plugged in to both sides. That is a very good thing, because I was worried that there was a mechanical problem in there. Which that, mechanically, except for one transistor that I replaced up in that AM circuit, is completely original and untouched. Except for, I guess, that weird mod that someone put there for the power supply. So, yeah, that's a good thing. Um, so why don't I do my plan? Actually, wait, let's see if, if I connect it to there and there. Oops. If I connect it to there and there. Let's see if that works for it. So then we know that there's not some kind of weird error actually inside the plastic housed part. I really didn't think that it would be the case that the interior plastic house part was the failure point, and it isn't. I tested it with the multimeter by putting it up to there and then there, turning the multimeter on on DC and I was going to 11.9 volts, so it is the wires. So there you go, 
It is set up like that. It should work now. Get all the parts out of here, plug it in, and test it out. All right, let's see. Oh, I hear something. This is a real concern. There it is. Do yourself a favor and call DCS Netlink in Rice Lake. I don't the think I will. I don't have the antenna extended, so the reception will be pretty poor, but this is a beast on FM. So, why don't we, there's FF, F, what does it say, FAA weather? We don't, they don't use that anymore, now they use NOAA. That's a very old, long way of weather band. Let's try AM. Using the wave magnet antenna up there. I can hear crackling on AM. I see what's going on. It accidentally trapped itself in there. Let me try to get that out. All right, that's all connected way up there. I don't think we have too many AM stations around at all. So, why don't we go back to FM? So then, As you can see, much, and here, much more stations are around. And double. So, yeah. Here on this See what shortwave brings us. You have to crank it up for shortwave. Nothing much on shortwave anymore, at least not in English. I don't think anything runs on English in shortwave. But you might hear a number station, which is always kind of chilling. <laughs> Um, for spy agencies. And fun fact about these Zenith Transoceanic 3000s is that uh, during the cu Cubic, Cuban Missile Crisis, John F. Kennedy had three of these in the Oval Office because of their shortwave capabilities. And these are very good shortwave radios, especially with an external antenna. So, yeah, a little neat history behind these Zenith Transoceanics. Thank you for watching, and it works now.